Welcome back to the Data Science with MATLAB video series. This video will focus on pre-processing the data, which is a really important step in the data science workflow. Now that we've brought in the data, uh, we've brought in a subset of the data, we want to do some pre-processing. And so there are lots and lots of ways that we want to approach this problem, and or I'm actually just going to go through all of them, because this is what we work with in data science. Data are just messy. They're all different types. Um, so we're going to um, talk a little bit about using the best MATLAB data type for the job, um, how to access the data, pre-processing with different kinds of data types. And then uh, one of the biggest headaches for me uh, and many of us are uh, working with missing data. And so, you know, we'll spend some time talking about that. And then other common situations like outliers, um, merging data, resampling, um, and all those kinds of things uh, that we'll, we'll dig into. So we're going to work with our storm event data, and then we're also going to merge this in with some uh, current weather data just to explore a little bit um, and make sure that our, our weather data are on the right times. So let's start by examining our data, and so just to kind of remind us what we're dealing with. And sure enough, we've got numeric data, we've got um, our categorical data, like our state, event types. We've got times, so the beginning and end time of each storm. Then we have our damage costs, and these are currently actually strings. So, you know, it says 2K, and so that's representing thousands. So we'll have to uh, figure out how to deal with that. We also have the source, so, um, you know, where the data were recorded from, the latitude longitude, uh, which we'll also need to convert to numeric. And then we have this um, event narrative, which is really interesting. It's a um, text, a free text field that someone just described the storm. And so in our case, also access data in more complicated ways. So for example, if we want to just select data from one location, we can do that by using logic. So if we want to just see how many um, data points are from Alaska, we can just say data.state equals Alaska. And so we can also use this to access the data. So I can use that logical expression to um, represent the rows that I want to bring from the data set. Um, okay, so that's uh, how I would do this for one state. Say, um, in this case, I just want to use data from uh, certain sources uh, from the U.S. government. And so I can also uh, select that uh, very similarly uh, to how we just did by representing the rows as our logical expression and then selecting all of the columns of data. And so uh, since these are also in tables, I have some nice functions I can use to um, reorder and reorganize the data as I see fit, or remove the variables I don't need anymore, like the event ID and the source. And so I moved the um, variables, uh, the time variables, in front of the other ones. So I've been talking about um, tables quite a lot. Let's actually talk a bit more about how to represent data in MATLAB, generally speaking. There are sort of our traditional data types, which are numeric, um, char data, sort of uh, your low level kind of uh, data types. And then over the past couple of years, uh, we've introduced a lot of really nice data types for data science kind of situations. So uh, you'll see these in the example, like categoricals, date times, durations. Um, our table and timetable can actually contain any of these variables. And so that's what What's uh, different about the tables that we've been using so far, you contain a number of different data types in that table, similar to a spreadsheet. And so all of these also could be made tall. And so uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later too, where uh, you can you know, treat the data, which is actually out of memory, just as a typical MATLAB variable. And so that kind of gives us uh, you know, the overview of the different data types. Let's actually now talk about some of the benefits of using these data types. So we'll start by uh, doing our time series pre-processing. All right, so let's take another look at our table again. And so again, we have our begin times and end times. And if we wanted to do you know, pre-processing with those times, maybe we want to change the dates, uh, we can do all of that using uh, date time variables. So for example, if we take a look at our beginning timestamp, um, this is our you know, time of year and then time of day. And in this case, um, it doesn't really indicate which one is the year. It's, I probably can assume it's not the future. 
Um, but we might want to just update the format to our liking. So it uses the default from the file, but we can adjust this as we like. And so now it's a little bit more readable. And now I can actually uh, determine the duration of each storm. And so if you imagine, um, if we're trying to predict the damage costs or the impact of these storms, a very long a, a tornado that lasts for three hours is likely more uh, costly than a 10-minute tornado. Uh, so this is a very important variable for us in our um, exploration. And so now I've got the storm duration. And we can take a quick look at this. Uh, we can just use our typical stats functions like max, uh, mean, those kinds of things to explore the time. So for example, the max duration was 743 hours, which turns out to be about a month. Um, and you know, the mean is about 17 hours. If we look at a histogram, this gives us a better idea of uh, the distribution. And you know, sure enough, these are all sort of pretty low. But then we have a couple out here um, that are you know, around a month. Um, but let's actually look at some of the uh, top it's about the top 10. Um, so we were looking at the uh, longest storms lasting for a whole month. Uh, let's actually pick out the top 10 most uh, longest, longest storms and uh, check these out. And so in this case, these are all droughts. And so that kind of makes a little bit more sense than um, a hurricane lasting for a month. All right, so if we want to do a bit more pre-processing with our time, we can create a timetable. And so it's very similar to a table, which we've been working with, but it actually uses the timestamps as the rows of the table. And so you can access the data with the time, um, and you can do a lot of other nice pre-processing steps that are sort of headaches sometimes when you're working with time series. Tables and timetables also contain properties uh, that can help contain metadata. And so with these applications, you often have a lot of information about the variables that you can capture here. And so um, you know, we have our variable names, we have uh, the you know, time information, and then any custom properties that you want to add yourself. So our time dimension is called begin timestamp. It might be easier if I just call it time. And so let's also take a look at the range. So I want to see, you know, make sure that the time range uh, is correct. And so sure enough, this is from um, January 2016 to uh, December 2017. Let's now take a look at our categorical data. And so uh, categorical data, it's more, um, it's like a label or a repeated label. Like in this case, we have the US state or the event type. And if you use the actual categorical data type in MATLAB, you have a lot of really nice functionality that comes with it that will help you work with these kind of variables. And so um, first off, I can just get a quick summary. It gives me a, an idea of what sort of categories I have and how many. And so I can see already that I'm going to need to do some pre-processing. You know, I, I probably want to remove things over bodies of water. Uh, and then for my event types, uh, some of these could be combined. You know, for example, you know, maybe heavy rain and rain could be considered the same category. Um, I also have very few of these, so you know, we might want to remove those all together when we're doing predictions. So we can also take a quick look at this with a uh, histogram. Um, I've created a function to uh, make a bigger figure, a tall figure, um, so that uh, I can see all of this at once. And so, you know, as you can see, there are lots of thunderstorm winds, high winds, lots of tornadoes, um, winter storms. And so you can get a quick idea of the distribution of these events. So as I mentioned, we probably want to combine some of these just to make a little bit more sense. And so maybe with wind, we could combine wind and high wind to just be all wind. And I'm going to um, continue this over and over again. So I've created a live function um, that goes through the same process for a mul multiple other variables. So for example, you know, snow, heavy snow, flood, um, heavy floods, those kinds of things will all be combined. And so I'll go back here, use my live function, and uh, check out the new categories. So sure enough, this is a much more manageable uh, list of categories. And we still have good, interesting ones like um, dust storms and debris flow. All right, so that takes care of our categorical data. And uh, we also have some textual data that we need to work, work with. So um, some of it is textual by nature, like our um, event narratives. So you know the things, the free text that somebody actually wrote. So that's appropriate to keep as a string data type in MATLAB. 
The other ones in our um, data set are not appropriate as strings, so we're gonna need to convert these. Um, and for me, I always, if I don't know what the data type should be or I'm not sure what it looks like, I'll just bring it in as a string so I can go ahead and pre-process and convert later, um, just because it's very friendly to do that. So uh, first, I'll make sure all of the um, event narratives are lowercase, just so I can more easily um, you know, analyze those. And then I have another function to do our string preprocessing um, that converts our data types. And so, for example, it's just going through and converting our latitude and longitude directly uh, just to double precision. And our um, damage cost variables, it's detecting um, where it says M or K for uh, millions or thousands uh, and you know, changing the units based on that. And so now I will run that function and we'll check out our results. Uh, now we have a much more manageable data set and our numbers are actually numbers and our text is text. All right, so now that everything is in this, the right data type, um, we have a lot of missing data. So we wanna figure out how to approach this. And so sometimes we wanna remove these, sometimes we wanna fill them. Um, we have lots of options in MATLAB. So you know we could standardize, we can detect them, remove or fill them with a bunch of different options. And so in this case, let's just take a quick look to see how much I actually have. And so if we, um, we can use is missing, and that lets me know that you know, the some of them have no missing data, some of them have you know, 13,000 uh, missing data points. Um, but first things first, we wanna remove rows that have all missing data. And so if it's all missing except for the time, that's not helpful to us. Another thing that we need to do is add our damage costs. But sometimes there are uh, missing data in one of those uh, variables. And so I can um, tell the function to omit NANs. So, you know, just ignore the missing data as you're c calculating. All right, so our event data is looking good. Um, but now we also want to compare this to current weather data. And so we actually have um, at our MathWorks headquarters in Natick, uh, Massachusetts, we have sensors on our uh, building that give us weather data. We use ThingSpeak to uh, store the data from the sensors, and I can use ThingSpeak Read to bring that into MATLAB. Through ThingSpeak Read, I can choose uh, the date range. So I want to make sure I'm choosing a range from the study. And it's bringing back um, you know, typical meteorological information, like the wind direction, wind speed, temperature, humidity, all that kind of stuff. And we can take a quick visual, uh, a quick visual look at this with a stacked plot. Whenever you pass a timetable, it'll actually show you all of the variables at once. And so, as you can see, you know this is also a bit messy. You know there are some outliers. We're probably going to want to do some smoothing. Um, you know, so it's a little bit different types of preprocessing. So when it comes to outliers, it's very similar to what to our approach with missing data. So I can detect them with is outlier, and then I can decide to remove or fill them with a bunch of different methods that um, the function provides. So first, let's check to see if I have outliers, and um, I can choose the method uh, to detect the outliers. So in this case, I'm doing a median. And so you can see some have uh, multiple, you know, some have very few. I know that uh, with the light intensity data, I want to just go ahead and fill those um, All together. Another thing with sensor data is that you know sometimes uh, you might have um, you know hourly or you know data on the minute or on the second, and we want to just make sure this is consistent throughout uh, the whole data set. Uh, it's much easier in our analysis that they're on the same time, and so we can resample or retime. And uh, in this case, I'm going to use uh, linear interpolation to put all of the data on the minute. And sure enough, these are all on the same time now, and I can c carry on with some of my further analysis. And so, you know, we notice there's a lot of up and down. In doing my analysis, you know, I can, I can just uh, work with a smoothed set from here on out. And so the last thing I want to do is to synchronize the data. And so, you know, I mentioned that we have um, all of this event data, and we only have our sensor data for, you know, obviously Massachusetts, where the sensors are located. And so we can um, put these uh, data sets together, but we want to make sure that we're being careful about the times. And so if we use synchronize, um, we can actually choose what time we want. In this case, I'm saying first, so that's going to put everything on the time of the weather data. And then I can see that, you know, um, February 5th, there was a winter weather warning. On the 8th, there was a blizzard. And so if I look at a plot, 
I can see that um, you know these are some of the points um, where you know the blizzard happened and there was wind that was likely related, uh, winter weather, you know, all kind of related and nice to see on the visual. Thanks for watching. In the next video, we'll look at analyzing our data.